Hello again, everyone. So this is second part of uh, electrophoresis. So for now, I want to talk about um, specific electrophoresis. So like serum electrophoresis, reverse spinal electrophoresis, urine electrophoresis, and uh, DNA electrophoresis. So uh, one thing to talk about is what is serum. So as we know, blood is composed of red blood cells, uh, which transport oxygen, as well as plasma but there's also serum. So what's the difference between plasma and serum? So once we've um, kind of removed the red blood cells, what we have now is we have a liquid, okay? And that also, it can clot because as we know, blood has clotting factors. So once it has clotted or once you've removed the clotting factors and everything else, what remains is the serum, okay? And that contains um, proteins that have multiple functions. Okay, so uh, like we said, serum has proteins. And when we talk about proteins, there's like five or six um, classes of uh, serum proteins. And they have different functions. As you can see, they're listed here, the five classes of um, uh, serum proteins. And they have different functions. So albumins, they are more um, of uh, transferring proteins. So lipids can bind to albumins to be uh, transported in the blood and you have alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 beta 2 and gamma so um what does that have to do with what we're doing now right now so when we put serum through electrophoresis you will get these classes of proteins separated into uh, bands so like we said we've seen before what bands look like you know so you'll have the plate and you'll have bands where different classifications are and you guessed it uh, they separate because they have different physical physical properties like uh, size or charge or uh, surface area but here it's mostly size so like we said uh, depending on their size they will separate the smallest will move furthest and the uh, largest will remain um, at the starting point okay so how we visualize the, the bands of proteins uh, that's created is we use staining, okay? So there's two, um, two reasons that we use staining. First of all, is to see the different proteins. So this is non-specific. You just stain something and stain the, the sample, the serum, and it colors in the, the patterns. And you can see albumins, and then you can see alpha-1 and, uh, and alpha-2, and beta 1 and beta 2 and gamma okay so the the dyes that we use i would recommend that you land two of them maybe am amido black because it's easy and uh promophenol blue i don't know why but yeah but just know a couple of these so that because sometimes it will ask about the dyes that are used during serum electrophoresis uh, and their purpose is to make all proteins visible and as we know uh dyes as we discussed before are anionic so that means they're negatively charged so the same way that we talked about high resolution electrophoresis before we can also use high, high resolution electrophoresis here in order to see the classes more clearly so sometimes beta 1 and beta 2 don't separate and you will see them as you will see them as one band so that's when high resolution comes in and that's when we use um, and also if you want to see minor proteins, so if you want to see the different proteins in each class, you can also use high resolution. Um, and that's when we use uh, silver or fluorescent staining. So fluorescent gives off uh, different photons of light and then you can see, you can scan them and see where the, the light is being emitted. And that's how you know that that uh, place contains a certain um, class or type of protein. Okay, you can also use staining to show function. So as we know, proteins can be glycoproteins. They can they can have different tertiary structures. They can have prosthetic groups, and you can use st stains that or dyes that bind to these functional groups in order to um, show you the function of the or the biological activity of the protein. Okay, so yeah, it gives examples here of how uh, that can be done, and you you can use them to label. Maybe if you don't have a certain um, pattern then you know that uh, the functional group is missing or something's wrong with it and that's how you know that someone has a disease you know okay so moving on 
I recommend you uh, learn this table because uh, you will get you will get asked about it. And uh, yeah, you'll there's this, this question actually appeared in the protocol, and it says the norm normal serum uh, albumin to globulins uh, ratio for an adult is 1.5 with a range of 0.8 to 2.0. So this sentence came in the protocol, which we will go through um, if we have time. And then we have uh, densometers. Then yeah, density densitometers. <laughs> So what densitometers do is they tell you how much of a certain class of protein or how much of a protein there is in a certain um, area and where it has traveled in the plate. So like we see here, this is the pattern that you get. You'll see that uh, some proteins like albumins have higher density than others. And you can uh, translate that into a graph depending on the density. So depending on the density of the of the dyeing okay you can tell the density of the, a certain protein in that area and then you can plot it on a graph do know which ones separate first so we have albumins alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 beta 2 and then gamma so know that they separate in that order and also know the general shape of this graph because you are going to get asked about it and here you can see the percentages okay so it wouldn't do you harm to know the percentages and as well you have to be able to draw the graph telling which um, part is the anode and which part is the cathode okay so another question i've seen is um what is the ph that serum electrophoresis is um, done at and that was 8.6 so uh, if you've done this in the lab you, you will see that you used five microliters of, of the serum 1% gel, pH 8.6, and 150 volts for 30 minutes, okay? And here's also the, the, the stain or the dye that we used. All right, so now that we know that this is the normal pattern that you see, we can tell uh, what diseases people might have or deficiencies people might have using the control pattern, so the pattern that's normal or you're supposed to see, okay? And that's um, that's where specific uh, diseases come in, and you will see the patterns uh, associated with these uh, diseases. Okay, so we have something called bis albuminia, and that what the, what that, essentially what that means. If you remember from transmission genetics, we said that some people may have maybe heterozygous. Okay, and therefore they pr produce two um, two proteins or two versions of a protein. And that's exactly what this is. So people might have to, might be heterozygous uh, for the production of albumin, you know, and you're, you will see that there are two types of albumins or two bands of albumins, uh, depending on the proteins that, that the albumins are being produced and their mobility. Okay, so they will produce the two types. Okay, and now we go on to the specific patterns and the diseases associated with them. So first of all, the gamma, the gamma globulins, you put something you need to know, is they, that they are antibodies, okay? So if you have an infection or um, an inflammation or anything, what will happen, or allergy even, is you will see that your antibody counts increases, okay? So therefore, the gamma region of the, immuno, the, of the globulins, also called immunoglobulins, will spike okay so if you have and also if you have any sort of um inflammation or um infection you will see that also albumin decreases so a characteristic of telling if someone has an inflammation whether that's um a liver uh, infection or, or, or whatever you will see that the gamma globulins they go up and the albumins will go down, okay? All right, so that's essentially what it's talking about here. So hypoalbuminemia, this is basically the hypo, means decrease or uh, decrease in level of albumins, okay? So that happens when you have liver disease, uh, inflammation, cancer, uh, poor nutritional state, or basically you're malnourished, okay? 
and also it says here that ga um, gamma globulins gamma globulins uh, are basically antibodies and if you have any um, inflammation or uh, infection you will see that they spike up here is a more detailed version of that so yeah here it says that uh, the inflammatory response uh, is characterized by increase in alpha 1 and alpha 2 so you will see that alpha 1 and alpha 2 increase okay and we said already that alpha means decrease so alpha 1 and alpha 2 will increase albumin decreases and globulins also increase and you'll have a decrease in beta globulins so the beta globulins are going to decrease so that's how you know you have an inflammatory response uh, and for chronic inflammation so for an inflammation that's been going uh, on for um, an extended period of time you'll see that the gamma globulins also um, increase okay and you will see depending on on the on the disease you might see different things so if you have an overall decrease so if the density of all of them is decreased that usually tells us that they're missing due to being excreted okay so for example renal protein loss you're urinating the proteins out due to um, an effect in your uh, kidneys which we will talk about later yeah, and this chart is actually pretty useful because it tell it, it kind of translates the translates the uh, um, chart chart to diseases. So it tells you okay, well if we have if you have increasing gamma, then you have chronic inflammation. Um, let's see, uh, increase in alpha globulins, alpha one, alpha two. Then you probably have inf an inflammatory response. A decrease in uh, algal albumins then you might have cancer or liver disease or so on and also shows you a sample of these you can also search these up on google if you're really interested <clears throat> so um yeah also again here it, it talks about um more patterns and ways that we can use um electrophoresis and then we go on to cerebrospinal uh, fluid protein electrophoresis. So cerebrospinal fluid. What is cerebrospinal fluid? Cere cerebrospinal fluid is a fluid that is, is included in the ventricles of the brain. Okay. So as we know, the brain is very fragile. Okay. And it can sometimes, if you even leave it out in um, normal atmospheric pressure, it will collapse under its own weight. And how we avoid that in our bodies is by surrounding the brain with something called cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, and this cerebrospinal fluid, it, it gives the brain its nutrients, um, uh, all the proteins that, that are needed, some of the serum proteins as well. Uh, and within these ventricles, you'll get to know them more in anatomy and also physiology. Um, within these ventricles, you have, you have something called uh, the, the choroid plexus. And what that does is it uh, supplies more cerebrospinal fluid, okay? So yeah, cerebrospinal fluid has the same proteins in the serum, uh, excluding immunoglobulins, okay? Uh, or certain immunoglobulins because of something called the blood-brain barrier. So the cerebrospinal fluid is not only produced in the choroid plexus, but it also gets some of its content from the blood. So what content does it exactly does it get from the blood that it doesn't produce on its own anything with a molecule with a certain molecular mass okay so you kind of have a built-in filter okay and that's called the blood brain barrier okay so that's the 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 barrier that determines what goes into the cerebrospinal fluid and what stays in the blood so certain proteins with larger uh, molecular mass like some immunoglobulins will not get through but they are produced uh, within the brain um, by uh, other glial cells that you will get to know better in histology as well and, and biology so yeah uh, let's let's dive into it so Two things that we're really interested about here is albumins and immunoglobulin G because these two usually tells you usually tell you 
uh, what disease or what pattern you will see. So something that's pretty different from a normal uh, electrophoresis, serum electrophoresis is that you will get um, pre-albumin. So pre-albumin is also called uh, tranthyretine, okay? Is only present in the cerebrospinal fluid or present in, in very, little, very, very little amounts in the serum. But in cerebrospinal fluid, pre-albumin, you, you will see, if you did the electrophoresis, you will see a band over the albumin, and that's why it's called pre-albumin, actually. So you can guess that it's a smaller molecule. Okay, and you also get something called oligoclonal bands. So normally, in CSF, these are absent. Okay, however, if you do, if, if you do have oligoclonal bands, bands present in your sample, that is usually an indicator of an infection, which is, or a tumor, which is very dangerous in the brain, okay? So, yeah, and then it goes on to general information about uh, cerebrospinal fluid, so it tells you that about 3-5% to 5 of it is immunoglobulin G. And now we go on to urine. Uh, so, like, like we said, urine doesn't have much proteins because of a certain filtration process that is built in our kidney. So how that happens is through something called the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. So you can see here, that's not very clear, but basically you have an, an afferent and an efferent arterial, okay? And the arterial goes into a, um, a structure called glomerulus. And what the glomerulus is, is basically like a, um, what you call it, a network of capillaries, okay, that the blood flows through. And then you have uh, the Bowman's capsule. So this is the part that's collecting the sort of excretions. So uh, the urea and everything that you want to pee out, basically, okay? And at certain levels of the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule complex, you get filtration of proteins depending on their um, molecular mass. So proteins with larger molecular mass will be separated at the very top and then uh, so on. Okay, so if you have proteins with very large molecular mass, in the, in the urine, that means that there is a very, um, uh, very large damage to the complex, especially to the glomerulus, okay? So, like we said, it, it doesn't uh, let much proteins through, but you will see that certain proteins like uh, albumins uh, will get through because they have very small molecular mass, and it's a filtration process, so it's not perfect. You will see a lot of plasma proteins. However, in order for us to see a pattern, you need to concentrate the the urine samples in order to get more proteins in the urine sample, okay, and exclude the water. And therefore, you will, you might be able to see um, a pattern in electrophoresis, okay. So yeah, one more thing: when the plasma proteins, as soon as they cross the glomerular membrane, uh, they become they, they're filtered out inversely proportional to their size. So that's what we were talking about. The more, the larger the, the protein is, the less likely it will be filtered. The, the less likely it will go through, and the more likely that it will be filtered. Okay, and the glomerulus is um, negatively charged. So, uh, what else? Yeah, so we have different uh, diseases that or problems that can happen uh, with urine electrophoresis. So you have proteinuria so proteinuria what that means is it's a disease in the glomerulus so the glomerulus is like we like we discussed before it's this part the network of capillaries okay that acts as a filter of the protein and you will see that damage to that area will cause that a larger quantity of proteins um in the serum okay and you will have low absorption at the proximal tubule. So what does that mean? Uh, there are different types of proteinuria and what is the proximal tubule? So I will try to include a picture here, but there's no promises because I'm not that that good at uh, <laughs> editing yet. But what you have in the kidney is, let me try and draw it for you. Uh, just leave a pen. 
Yeah, there we go. Yes. So you will have the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. Okay. And then you will have the proximal tubule and then the distal tubule. Okay. And what happens here and here is something called selective reabsorption. So certain proteins, stuff that's not supposed to be in the urine, is reabsorbed into the blood. The mechanism for that you don't need to know for now, but if you are interested, is through uh, primary and secondary active transport. Um, and you can you can read more about selective reabsorption uh, at the proximal and distal tubules if you're interested. And you're going to learn about it anyways if you don't know it already. So yeah, so you might have low reabsorption at the proximal tubule. That means that more proteins get through. Okay, or you might have um, glomerular proteinuria. So that means damage to the glomerulus and therefore the in increased quantity of serum. Okay, or uh, increased increased quantity of proteins in the serum. Okay, which is called overflow proteinuria. So you have uh, here it mentions three glomerular proteinuria. So that means that a disease in the glomerulus or damage in the glomerulus allows certain proteins to get through. And you can have overflow proteinuria, which means that increased quantity of proteins in the serum. So you're uh, you're kicking out too much protein, or you're selective re selectively reabsorbing too much proteins at the proximal and distal tubules. Or you can have tubular proteinuria. So that means low reabsorption at the proximal tubule. So we can distinguish which type of proteinuria you have depending on the pattern in electrophoresis. Okay. So depending on the size or the molecular mass of the proteins that are getting through, you can distinguish which disease you have. Okay. So if you see that larger, very large proteins are not getting through, or very large proteins are getting through, I mean, so that means that the glomerulus is damaged and therefore it's not filtering out proteins that is supposed to be uh, filtering out okay uh, and yeah as it says those selective uh, glomerular proteinuria you will see strong bands of albumins and strong bands of uh, beta beta 1 uh, proteins or globulins and weak to strong alpha 1 zones okay so you and it's not Unfortunately, it's not very clear here, but you can see it. There we go. Yeah, so uh, number one, here you can see severe glomerular proteinuria. So it said very strong uh, albumins and uh, strong beta-1 and weak to broad um, alpha-1 uh, bands, which is exactly what we see here. And yeah, it, if you want my advice, instead of learning all of this, you can just have a look at these and read that, and you will see, it's not very clear, and you will see that it pretty much describes the last page, okay? So different patterns uh, associated with different types of proteinuria, okay? And you also some, have something called uh, post-renal proteinuria. So if you have an, a urinary tract infection, uh, you will see a pattern close to glomerular proteinuria. Uh, but the difference is that there is no alpha-2 macroglobulins. And then you have, if, if something's chronic, so like I said, it's, it's been present over a certain period of time, you will see that you can have two patterns, two patterns of diseases in your electrophoresis. And that's how you know it's chronic. So on to... Uh, lipo serum lipoproteins electrophoresis. So, first of all, we have chylomicrons, we have high density lipoproteins, we have um, low density lipoproteins, and we have very low density um, lipoproteins. Uh, okay, and we, we name them depending on how far they travel in the electrophoresis. So, first of all, we named four just now. Uh, so for the, the first one is chylomicrons, and we call these beta lipoproteins. Uh, sorry, the chylomicrons is just called chylomicrons. And then you have beta lipoproteins, and these are the low density and the um, intermediate density uh, lipoproteins. And then you have pre-beta, and these are the very low density lipoproteins. And then you have alpha 
lipoproteins, which are the high density lipoproteins. So what are the differences between the, the lipoproteins? Why, why are some of them higher density than others? So first of all, one thing you need to know that this uh, electrophoresis occurs in alkaline pH. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, the densities of the lipoproteins depends on their composition. So from the name lipo, lipids, and proteins. So you have lipids and proteins. The function of lipoproteins is essentially to transport lipids um, in the blood because like we know, lipids are uh, fat soluble. They're not water soluble. So therefore, you cannot transport them the same way you transport water soluble molecules like ions. So you have to get these specialized lipoprotein molecules. And what they are is you have um, a phospholipid bilayer. So you have a sort of protective a membrane and then inside you will have the lipid uh, content and then you also have um, something called the apoprotein okay so this um, apoprotein is uh, the protein that's present in the the membrane and you can have integral and non-integral proteins or peripheral proteins the same way that you can have in a normal plasma membrane you can see here sort of a cross section of the surface of um, lipoproteins and yeah so depending on how much so like we know lipids are low density okay and they're non soluble in water so if you have more lipids then you're going to have lower density and therefore it's going to be less soluble okay so from that information we can guess that the the one that when we say cholesterol or bad cholesterol we mean low density lipoproteins or very low density lipoproteins because these are non-water soluble and therefore they form clots, especially when they stick together, they, they form clots. Okay, so these have higher lipid content and therefore they are lower density and less soluble in water. However, chylo, uh, chylomicrons, uh, sorry, high density lipoproteins are protein, are, uh, sorry, lipoproteins, yeah, are lipoproteins that contain a lot of proteins and therefore they're uh, higher density and more soluble in water. So the good uh, lipoprotein is the high density and the bad lipoprotein is the low density lipoprotein. Don't, don't get, mix that up with fatty acids because you have saturated and unsaturated, but here we're talking about lipoproteins and yeah. So like we said, uh, these different lipoproteins have different densities and therefore we can uh, separate them through electrophoresis um, to get different patterns. So here you can see alpha, pre-beta, beta, and then chylomicrons. And you can also do a graph. Uh, like I said, I, I advise you to know the general pattern, the normal pattern, and also the general graph, knowing the, the cathode and the anode directions, because you might get asked to draw them. Um, so yeah, this is... Uh, what we were talking about and it says the, the different functions of the, the, the lipoproteins I am running out of time but you can you can uh, read these on your own so it just says that low density lipoproteins and intermediate uh, density lipoproteins are not usually detectable in the blood and that chylomicrons uh, transport fat from the liver uh, from the intestines to the liver and skeletal muscles and peripheral tissue and fat tissue and everything so yeah, and also a very VLDL or very low density lipoproteins carry triacylglycerols to the liver and fatty tissue. So you can read those in your own time. It's, it's not much uh, to explain. It's just learning, I think. So yeah, um, how we see this pattern is the same way that we that we see this pattern in um, in uh, serum uh, electrophoresis is by dyeing. Okay, but the dyes are lipid specific, so you can't use the same dyes. So you can use something like fat red or Sudan black. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it for lipo um, protein electrophoresis. And you can also, yeah, you can also say which kind of disease you have depending on the uh, pattern that you see and the percentage or the density of certain lipoproteins, okay? Uh, and this is important because it tells us the risk of heart disease. So if you have a very high uh, density, a very high uh, percentage of uh, low density lipoproteins or low density cholesterol, 
then you will see that you're more likely to have a heart attack, okay? And a higher percentage of HDL means that you're less likely to have a heart attack, okay? So on to electrophoresis of DNA, which I think is the last part, is it? Yeah, it is. So um, electrophoresis of DNA. One thing I want to uh, start off with is that uh, electrophoresis of DNA is not only used to uh, separate DNA, but also RNA. So it's nucleic acids, anything that has DNA, RNA, can even be um, used to separ separate uh, nucleotides, okay? So, like we said, because they're being separated by electrophoresis, uh, that means that they must have different uh, size or structure, or in this case, concentrations. So, the most influencing factors when separating DNA is um, structure and size, okay? So, first of all, we know that nucleotides are negatively charged because they have a phosphate group, and this phosphate group tends to donate its protons very easily. Okay, so in, in the electric field, you'll see that DNA molecules um, go from the negative end to the positive end because they are negatively charged, okay? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so like we said, smaller molecules migrate faster uh, than uh, larger molecules in uh, electrophoresis, and depending on the charge, because uh, they're negatively charged, you'll see them going from the negative end to the positive end. Um, so yeah, depending on the, the, the size of the chain of DNA or the, the length of the chain of nucleotides, you can use different resolutions. So if you have very large chains of nucleotides, you will say, oh, well, I don't need that high resolution because there, there, there's a big difference between the sizes of, of the chains of these uh, DNA, okay? So for long nucleic acids like DNA or RNA, we can use agarose gels, but for a smaller uh, nucleic acids, uh, you use acrylamide gel, so polyacrylamide gel that we were talking about earlier, because it has higher resolution, okay, so you can see the differences uh, more clearly, okay, of course, we know that DNA and RNA sometimes is are present with other proteins, so what we need to do in order to get them into chain-like structures, we need to denature them, so you have histone proteins, we don't need those histone proteins, we need to get rid of them, so we use um, urea and formalide, um, and yeah, that's how you uh, denature the proteins associated with the DNA in order to get the chains. So, like we said, the the, the main um, characteristic that we separate um, uh, nucleic acids on is their form or their structure. So DNA can have three forms: uh, form one, which is super helical, and what that means. Uh, is, is just a, a super helix of uh, DNA that forms secondary and tertiary structures as well. So it's, it's very, um, how do you say it? <laughs> it's very messy. <laughs> and then you have nicked open circular proteins, uh, sorry, DNA, and that's form two. So an example of that would be a plasmid. And then you also have linear uh, DNA, usually extracellular, extra nuclear DNA is um, linear or circular. So yeah, uh, form one, which is the super helical, like we said, is very uh, compact, so it travels uh, further in the electrophoresis than uh, form three. And form two, uh, yeah, so form one travels faster than form three, and form three travels faster than form one. No, form two. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, the the super helical travels faster, fastest, followed by the circular, and then the linear because the linear has the largest surface area, it's spread out the most. So if we're talking that they have the same size, you will see, or the same chain length, you will see that form one is the fastest, form three is the second fastest, and form no form two is the second fastest, and form three is the third fastest. Okay. Um. Yeah, so form one, form three, form two, form one, form three, form two, there we go. I'm just saying it for myself because I, I tend to forget as well. <laughs> so yeah, uh, after the DNA has been separated, you can also uh, elute the DNA from the, the gel in order to use it for uh, further analysis. So 
DNA uh, can be analyzed uh, using restriction, uh, in enzymatic restriction, so restriction enzymes, um, uh, sequencing, so and also labeling. So if you want to add a certain uh, fluorescent label or antibodies to it, or even plotting, okay. So it can be in used in combination with a lot of stuff in order to achieve in order to, to label certain protein sequences that are present or absent in other um, in other patterns. And that's how we also uh, carry out paternity, paternity and maternity, well, paternity um, tests. So that's, if you've ever watched Choose the Father, that's how they do it pretty much. So yeah, we also have, the way we measure the size of uh, proteins is using base pairs or kilo base pairs. So this tells you how many pairs of um, nucleotides there are. So like you know, uh, nu uh, nucleotides um, are complementary to each other. <clears throat> and then, yeah, you have base pairs and these form kind of the steps of the ladder in the superhelix. So, yeah. Um, what's the dye or stain that we used? The, st the stain used for DNA uh, electrophoresis is um, ethidium bromide, okay? And what it does is it inserts itself between in the spaces between the base pairs. So if you have um, the, a chain and then the end of the chain and then it's part of another chain, you will see that the um, ethidium bromide or ETBR uh, will insert itself into that space. So you, that's how you know whether it's a start or an end of uh, the DNA chain. And also, uh, you can use UV light to uh, tell exactly where the ethidium bromide is. And that's how you mark the start or the end of a different uh, chain. And one more thing about DNA electrophoresis is sometimes, if you have very small DNA fragments, <clears throat> um, sorry, very large DNA fragments, then you can use something called the pulsed field gel electrophoresis. So, so far we've used the electrophoresis in one direction, okay? Whether it's from negative to positive or from positive to negative. However, if you want to separate larger uh, DNA uh, chains, what you can do is you can change the, the, the direction of the fields, of the electric field. So you can go from negative to positive and then positive to negative, but negative to positive and so on. And that's called pulsed field gel electrophoresis. Okay, and what that does is it kind of shakes the DNA enough to separate uh, different chains from each other. So then you can see certain patterns. Okay. And yeah, it's kind of like you can you can steer something in one direction, but if with in this case, you're steering it in both directions. You so you're going from negative to positive, from positive to negative, and so on. So you're changing the field multiple times in order to see that separation uh, pattern. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the um, concepts of uh, specific electrophoresis. Uh, do have a read over them uh, because to know the certain percentages and the certain patterns and diseases uh, associated with these patterns. Um, and yeah, good luck with your exams and happy holidays.